This is ADTV, brought to you by Amazing Discoveries. Okay, well, it's great to see each one of you here. I'm glad I didn't scare away the entire um, congregation last night. It's such a blessing to see so many of new people here tonight as well. And as you can see on the screen, our title is Wolves in Sheep's Clothing. And I want you to do something very uh, practical before we begin. I want you to see if you can identify where is the wolf in this picture. Look very closely and see if you can tell. Where is the wolf? They all look like sheep, don't they? That's precisely the point. It's very hard to tell. So tonight, um, again, we're going to have a very sensitive subject. And, um, but I believe that God wants us to talk about the things that many people don't want to talk about. Jesus, in Matthew 7, verses 13 through 15, said some very stirring and shocking words. And he was speaking to a group of people at the time, and he said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, and the word straight there means strict or narrow, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So Jesus makes a very big categorical statement that there are many, many people who are not going to find the way of life, right? He says, many will go to the wide uh, gate, but few will find the narrow gate. And then, interesting, interestingly enough, he follows that deduction up with an interesting um, postscript to that, those two verses. In verse 15, he says, beware of false prophets which come to you in what kind of clothing? Sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening Wolves. Very fascinating. So when you think of a sheep, what's the first thing that comes to your mind besides what it says? Like that, right? What's the next thing that comes to your mind when you think of a sheep? It's wearing what normally? White, right? And white is normally associated in the Bible with the color of purity or righteousness. So it appears on the outside that these sheep are righteous, but amazingly, inwardly, they are ravening wolves. Wolves. Albert Pike, one of the central pillars of Freemasonry, he said the following, he said, that which we must say to a crowd is that we worship a God, but it is the God that one adores without superstition. To you, sovereign grand inspector generals, or 33rd degree Freemasons, we say this, that you may re repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the high degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. So basically what he was saying is when you get up high up in this as fraternal organization, not those on the lower level, but once you get high up, it is revealed to the very highest level that the actual God that is worshipped is not the God of the Bible, but is actually Lucifer. And they actually believe that Lucifer is the true Son of God. Here's another statement um, along that same line. I didn't share with you last night, but I thought it would be good to show you today. It says, It is far more important than men should strive to become Christ's than that they should believe that Jesus was Christ. Um, that is from a Masonic source. So it's important to Masonry for the people themselves to become Christ, but not that Jesus was Christ. Is that uh, in accordance with what the Bible teaches? Yes or no? Absolutely not. Let's take a look at another statement. It says, In our third degree, the acacia symbolizes the resurrection and life everlasting. Then the sprig most ordinary is presented to the master mason as a symbol of the immortality of the soul. And we had a whole lecture on how the Bible never once uses that phrase, immortality of the soul. 
because it's used 1,600 times the word soul, but not once is the immortal soul mentioned. And who came up with that theology in the Garden of Eden? Do you remember who it was? The serpent, exactly. It goes on by saying, It is intended to remind us by its unchanging nature as evergreen of the spiritual part of man, that emulation of the supreme architect of the universe. Now, who was that? Well, he defines it for us. Who has promised that we shall never, never die. Now, as you read the book of Genesis, chapters 1 through 3, who was it that said, if you eat of this fruit, you will die? Who said that? God, Jesus, right? But who said that if you eat it, it doesn't matter, you will never, never die? Who is that? It was the serpent. It was Satan. So, according to Freemasonry, who is the supreme architect of the universe? You tell me. Okay, thank you. One of the most famous preachers in the last century was a man named Norman Vincent Peale. Norman Vincent Peale was a 33rd degree Freemason. That is fact. It is in the Masonic Scottish Rite Journal. If you don't believe it, I can send you a calendar with his picture on it. Okay? And what did he have to say? He said, Freemasonry has always welcomed men of all faiths and religious beliefs to enter its doors. The only requirement is for good men to believe in the supreme architect and the immortality of the soul. And um, this man was very prominent in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, Norman Vincent Peale. He, he goes on by saying, Masons, in fact, go beyond narrow sectarianism and limiting dogma. They agree with the statement of the famous statesman and writer Edmund Burke, the body of all true religion consists, to be sure, in obedience to the will of the sovereign of the world. So, interesting. And... Um, Tonight, like I said before, we're going to be talking about some things that are pretty stirring. Some of you may recognize this gentleman on the screen. Uh, his name is Robert Schuller, um, well-known uh, preacher, Protestant preacher. A Protestant preacher is one who protests against the dogmas of Rome. And Mr. Schuller said some fascinating things, and he's still, you know, still doing ministry. His son is taking over for him. But he said the following. He said, I discovered the reality of that dynamic dimension in prayer that comes through visualizing. Don't try to understand it. Just start to enjoy it. It's true. It works. I tried it. Um, visualization is an occult technique that's taught where you visualize something. Some professional athletes are taught this. Before, for example, Sunday they play football. The, they're told to visualize what, how you will catch the ball, how you'll run. It's really come from the occult world. And Mr. Schuler, Pastor Schuler, has a church in Southern California called the Crystal Cathedral. And if you know anything about the New Age movement, crystals are very prominent in the New Age movement. Someone might say, well, that's just a coincidence. Well, let's keep reading what he says, and you may be the judge of that. He says in his book, Self-Esteem, the New Reformation, classical theology has erred in its insistence that theology be God-centered, not man-centered. So according to Mr. Schuller, classical theology is wrong because it's centered on God, not man. But my Bible says that if we lift up Christ and Him crucified, then we'll draw men to Him. Not, I shouldn't cater to the audience. I should tell the audience the message, depending on whether you like it. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. It's the truth. Notice this next statement. It says, one classical role of the pulpit and Protestantism has been to preach sermons. He puts in uh, kind of quote marks, which imply indoctrination more than education. Within this form of communication, there is an inherent intrinsic inclination to intimidate, manipulate, and hence offend the person's most prized quality of his humanness, or humanness, his dignity. So it sounds very, very beautiful, flowery language, but friends, if you don't, need, if you don't see your need of Christ, is there a point of coming to Christ? No. Let's look at this next statement. Sin is any act or thought that robs myself or another human being of his or her self-esteem. Now, we've discussed what sin is from the Bible. Do you remember what sin, the definition of sin is from the Bible? 1 John 3, 4 says sin is the transgression or breaking of the law, right? So the Bible doesn't say if I offend your self-esteem, that's sin. In fact, Jesus offended a lot of people's self-esteem, if you read the Gospels carefully. Notice what else what he says. He says, what we need is a theology of salvation that begins and ends with a recognition 
of every person's hunger for glory. Um, I have to disagree with that respectfully. I believe that there is someone that is hungry for glory, and that being was named Lucifer. You can read all about him in Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14. We need to realize we must decrease and he must increase. That's what John the Baptist said. He must decrease and I must, or, and, no, I must decrease, he must increase. Okay, here's another uh, statement from the same book, just to be sure um, what doctrine he's preaching. He says, to be born again means that we must be changed from a negative to a positive self-image, from inferiority to self-esteem, from fear to love, from doubt to trust. So being born again, my Bible says in 1 Peter 1.23 that we're born again by hearing the Word of God. 1 Peter 1.23. Notice the next statement. He says, The cross sanctifies the ego trip. For the cross protected our Lord's perfect self-esteem from turning into sinful pride. So basically he's saying that God had an ego trip and the cross sanctified his ego trip. Do you think that's biblical? Do you think it's biblical? Notice the next one. He says, Christ is the ideal one, for he was self-esteem incarnate. Jesus actually, if you read the Bible carefully, he humbled himself, came down to this world, took a manner like us. He humbled himself. He wasn't out for glory whatsoever. Notice this next statement. Jesus never called a person a sinner. Were you aware of that? I don't know what kind of Bible he's reading. Very interesting translation. But he says, rather he reserved his righteous rebuke for those who use their religious authority to generate guilt and cause people to lose their ability to taste and enjoy their right to dignity. Isn't that beautiful language? But it sounds just like the serpent, doesn't it? Here's another statement. The church's problem is that it has a God-centered theology for centuries. Okay, we've already read that one. When it needs a man-centered one. Notice statement number two. We're not bad we're merely badly informed of how good we are. Is that biblical? That's not biblical, is it? Number three, it would be an insult to the integrity of any human being to call him a sinner. So it would be an offense to you to call you a sinner. And Jesus knew his worth. His success fed his self-esteem. He suffered the cross to sanctify his self-esteem. And he bore the cross to sanctify your self-esteem. The cross will sanctify the ego trip. And notice the statement he made on Phil Donahue's show way back in 1980. It says, Jesus had an ego. He said, if I be lifted up, I would draw men, all men to me. Wow, what an ego trip he was on. Friends, that is a blasphemous statement. It is a terrible statement. Now here's another one, if you don't believe it. Here's another one. I mean, this is Amazing. He says, what sets me apart from fundamentalists, basically those who believe the Bible and the Bible alone, is that they are trying to convert everybody to believe how they believe. We know the things the major faiths can, what's that next word? Agree on. Do you see the unity there, the bringing things together? We know the things the major faiths can agree on. We try to focus on those without offending those with different viewpoints. You see, friends, it's not popular to tell the truth, is it? It's never been popular. It never will be popular. And Mr. Schuler is just playing on that, and he wants you know, to be popular. So he continues by saying, when we know that we've been redeemed and we know we're part of God's family, we are ready to dream that great divine dream of building the kingdom of God in the heavens. Is that what it says? In the world, the present day, in the world. This is not biblical, okay? Here's... Here's another one. I love the question here that this, he was giving a radio interview. This person called in with a very good question. And he said the following, How could the cross, as you write, sanctify the ego trip and make us proud in the light of passages that say, I hate pride and arrogance, Proverbs 8.13. Pride goes before destruction, Proverbs 16.18. The Lord detests all the proud, Proverbs 16.5. Do not be proud, Romans 12.16. Love does not boast, it is not proud, 1 Corinthians 13.4. In fact, Paul warns that in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves, 2 Timothy 3, verse 2. Why should we do anything to encourage people to become lovers of themselves? If Paul, in fact, warned others that this would be the state of godlessness in, this la in these last days. That's a great question, isn't it? I would really agree with that questioner. But let's hear what Mr. Schuler says. I hope you don't preach this because you could do a lot of damage to a lot of beautiful people. If you preach that text, oh man, I sure hope you give it the kind of interpretation that I do, or I'll tell you you'll drive them farther away and they'll be madder than hell at you, and they'll turn up 
turn down the Bible and they'll switch, on, switch you off and they'll turn on the rock music and Madonna. Just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean you should preach it. It is so difficult to preach some of these texts and not come across as lacking humility. It's fun, funny how he mentions humility when he talks about we should be, feed our self-esteem, isn't it? It seems like an oxymoronic statement. Here's another statement. It says um, this was actually his 1,000th telecast. He was congratulated by uh, Mother Teresa, Billy Graham, Coretta Scott King, all the living presidents of the United States, as well as entertainer Sammy Davis Jr. Now, Sammy Davis Jr. has a very interesting history. I don't know if you know, but he was actually an honorary member of the Church of Satan. If you don't believe me, you can research it out. I know it sounds crazy, but please, don't take my word for it. Search it out. Notice this next statement. This is from Christianity Today, 1984. He says, what we need is to positivize the words that have only had a negative connotation. There is no greater damage that can be done than to refer to the lost, sinful condition of man. Okay, let's say if I'm a, a sinner and you just tell me how great I am, would I have a need for a Savior to save me from my sin if you told me how, how wonderful I am? Would I have a need of Jesus? No, absolutely not. So this takes Jesus totally out of the equation. Okay, I don't think anything has been done in the manner of Christ. Oh, this is the same statement, I'm sorry. I repeated it there. The most effective mantras, like repetition, prayer kind of, employ the M sound, you can get the feel of it by repeating the words, I am, I am, many times over. Transcendental meditation, or TM, is not a religion, nor is it necessarily anti-Christian. Who claimed to be the I am that I am in the Bible? Who was that? God himself, right? So, and, and Jesus said that in John 6. So, saying I am, I am, I am over many times, it's not really something that we should... I don't think as Christians we should do, because we're not God, are we? We need Jesus as our Savior. Here's another statement. It says, it is time for Protestants to go to the shepherd, the Pope, and say, what do we have to do to come home? Robert Schuller said that. Does this man sound like a, a, a true Christian preacher, or does he sound perhaps like a mason in sheep's clothes? I, I believe he does. Here's another statement. If you don't believe me, you can read his book. Uh, I really don't recommend, but anyway, this is what he says. To be born again means we must be changed from a negative to a positive self-image, from inferiority to self-esteem, from fear to love, from doubt to trust. And we can pray, our Father in heaven, honorable is whose name? Our name. Now, what is he saying there? He is saying that we are God too. And that's exactly what masonry teaches at the highest level. So, and his book is endorsed by a very interesting preacher, um, someone from my home state of North Carolina, and notice, I don't know if you can read it on the bottom there, it says, Dr. Schuler has an amazing ministry. Dr. Billy Graham endorses his book. Very interesting. Now we're going to talk about the mega church movement, and if anyone is somewhat um, aware of Christian, uh, in Christian circles, what's happening today, the mega church movement is exploding across all denominational boundaries. And let's take a look at who was the founder of the mega church. Um, notice the statement here. It says, I've been credited or blamed, both are correct, as the founder of the mega church. This is Robert Schuller uh, saying that he was the first one to pair this new way of reaching out to others, the mega church. And one of his most treasured disciples was a man by the name of Bill Hybels. This is from his own webpage. You can go there today. And it says, Is your church all God wants it to be? Send your pastors and lay church leaders to the 34th Robert H. Schuller Institute for Successful Church Leadership, which brings together the most prominent pastors who make faith come alive in some of the country's largest churches like Bill Hybels of Willow Creek Community Church and Rick Warren of Saddleback Church, both graduates of the Institute. So these two prominent individuals, Christian leaders today, Bill Hybels and Rick Warren, sat under the tutelage of this man who says that he could basically, that he is God just as much as Jesus is God. So, very fascinating. What else can we learn about this whole issue? Schuler says, speaking of Hybels, I found myself, well, actually, he speaks of the Pope first. I found myself immediately attracted to Pope John Paul II when, upon his election to the papacy, his published speeches invariably called attention to the need for recognizing the dignity of the human being as a child of God. Now, I agree with that statement in many respects. I believe that people need to recognize that they need Christ and they need to understand that they're a child of God.
But there is a problem when we focus so much on the needs that people have that we lay the gospel aside and we just fill their needs all the time. Let's say, for example, that I gave you money all the time. You were poor and I gave you money consistently. And you came to me always and said, John, could I borrow some money? And I gave you money consistently. I was filling a need that you had. But I would never tell you about their sinful condition. So it was almost in a sense that I'm taking the place of someone else by filling their needs constantly. Do you follow what I'm saying? And so this type of ministry lends to that type of mindset. Uh, another statement here, um, the men who inspired Bill Hybels, a uh, French-born professor of Trinity College in Deerfield, Illinois. It was there that he indoctrinated Hybels in his new kind of ministry. Schuler says, I was the first person to introduce real church growth to the American church. He, Hybels, became the first guy to take these principles, refine them, maximize them to the ultimate length of their potential. I'm so proud of him. I think of him as a son. I think of him as one of the greatest things that happen in Christianity in our time. Bill Hybels is doing the best job of anybody I know. Um, but the question is, which gospel is being preached? Here's another statement. Um, George Barna, a prominent church growth strategist, says that Hybels and Warren have gone as far, far to say, it is critical that we keep in mind the fundamental principle of Christian communication. The audience, not the message, is sovereign. So what's the most important thing when you preach according to these men? Is the message the most important thing? No, it's what the audience wants. So if, let's say, for example, that if you have a church that wants um, uh, rock music, then you play whatever they want to attract them, to bring them to the church. It doesn't matter the message. It just matters what they want. So I have to disagree with that biblically. I believe that everyone is entitled to hear the truth no matter what they believe. If our advertising is going to stop people in the midst of hectic schedules and cause them to think about what we're saying, our message has to be adapted to the needs of the audience. So again, the audience is paramount and the message is pushed down. Is Willow Creek correct in their teaching of that a relationship with Christ will provide a life of fulfillment? In a word, no. Personal fulfillment is the dominant goal of the vast majority of Americans. In this context, it is a great temptation for American evangelicals to argue that Christianity is a means of a more fulfilling life. The church becomes another place that promises to satisfy emotional desires. To argue for Christianity primarily by pointing to its usefulness and satisfy, satisfying felt needs is to ultimately undercut it. So if Christianity, all it does is fulfill your needs, then Christianity has shifted from being what it's, God set it out to do. It's becoming a very highly sophisticated social club where people come to get their needs met, but they don't hear the truth anymore. That is happening all around the world and all around North America. It says to, um, to teach Christianity as, it, as a means eventually teaches that it's super, superfluous, which means meaningless. If someone is able to satisfy their felt needs without Christ, the message of Christianity can be discarded. So in other words, as long as you have your needs met, then you really don't need Christ, right? You get the money you need, you get fed, you get all this and that. So there's no need for Christ. The bottom line why individuals should repent and worship God is because God deserves it. Fulfillment theology does not reflect the teaching of the Bible. And I really agree with that statement. Beautiful. Well, here's another statement. He goes on by talking a little bit more. He says, Now, however, rather than Schuler's self-esteem message being promoted as debate, debate is rather personal fulfillment. Have you ever heard that words before? Being personally fulfilled? Very interesting. We rejoice that the pure Schulerian heresy, the redefinition of sin, was abandoned. Nevertheless, at Willow Creek, sin is still minimized and marginalized. And it's fascinating if you do a little research how this church started. They did a survey, all the people in the neighborhood, and they said, what do you want at church? And they said, well, I would like to have um, a, like a drama at church, and I would like to have uh, movies at church. I would like to have you know, all these things at church. So eventually the church is a means of entertainment. It's just a way to entertain people. And so this church is packed every week. Thousands and thousands of people are coming, but they're just being entertained. They're not getting the real gospel. And he goes on by saying, um, Heibel stresses personal fulfillment and user-friendly doctrine. In the final analysis, it is not possible to understand Willow Creek's method and message without exploring the source of Willow Creek. If you go upstream from Willow Creek, you will come to its headwaters flowing from Garden Grove, California and the Crystal Cathedral, emanating from Mr. Schuler's church. So Rick Warren is very, very popular today. He's probably the most popular Christian author. 
He has written a book, as many well of us, we all know, called The Purpose Driven Life and The Purpose Driven Church. And uh, I think it's fair for us to just take a look at some of those things in the light of what we've studied thus far. Um, he was voted in Time Magazine as one of the most influential evangelicals in America. Actually, he was the number one, if you had that Time Magazine. And uh, Mr. Schuler here speaks about Mr. Warren, and he says, And there's Rick Warren, a pastor who came today who is phenomenal. He came to our institute time after time. So he's really lifting this guy up. Okay, let's keep going. And here, Mr. Warren was on, this was last year, on Larry King Live. Very interesting interview. And um, Larry King asked, um, actually, no, I'm sorry, this was Robert Schuler, not Rick Warren. But he said, Reverend Schuler, how did you come to Pastor Rick Warren, whose book, The Purpose Driven Life, is a bestseller, so forth. And he says, well, about 30 years ago, I founded an institute for successful church leadership, and I was trying to tell pastors that they should focus on the needs of people, okay? Focus on the hurts of human beings. Be a mission. Don't just be a church peddling your own doctrine. But really try to be a place where the love of God and the love of Jesus comes through. And he went for a few years and said, apparently, it impacted him. So what is lifted up instead of doctrine? They say the love of God, right? But friends, you cannot... It's a strange phenomenon for me. Sometimes people tell me, they say, you have to preach love. You can't preach what the Bible says. You have to just preach the love of God. Well, friends, you cannot preach doctrine without preaching the love of God. You see, Jesus loved people so much that he told them the truth. If I love you, if your house is burning down, I'm not going to not tell you. I'm going to tell you with all my might, right? So this is a very interesting uh, mingling. It's kind of a strange fascination that love somehow has put only flowery language. No, love tells the truth no matter what the consequences. That is true love. But anyway, he goes on uh, raving about the book. And uh, Mr. Warren goes on again about in his book talking about how that we should... Um, I'll just go ahead and start from this point here. It says, the principle of pragmatism. He says, pastors need to learn to recognize a wave of God's spirit and ride it or catch a spiritual wave of growth. If it works, it must be right. So whatever works must be right. Is that biblical, you think? Whatever works must be right? You know, I could do all kinds of crazy things to get people to come to this meeting, but it may not be right if I do it. He encourages young pastors to leave behind that old-fashioned church music in favor of jazz or rock, whatever turns your people on. He encourages people to dress down for church and so forth. So in the last page, he says, or page 62, Warren attempts to shelter himself from criticism on this issue. He says, never criticize what God is blessing, even though it may be a style of ministry that makes you uncomfortable. Who says God is blessing it? If you read the Bible very carefully, you'll find that many times, if you read the story of, um, um, what's the guy's name who... I can't, I'm, it escapes me now, uh, where he, was, he went down to the water and he drank some water and he said, you have to go down a certain... Gideon, right? Remember Gideon's story? How many people were following Gideon at, Gideon at the beginning? Thousands and thousands, right? But as God get, get further down, there was only a few in number. But God doesn't need a lot of people. He just needs converted people. And if he has converted people, he can do great things, even um, in a small town like this. Here's another statement. It says, when Rick Warren uses the very same methodology of Robert Schuller and Hywels, he says, not surprisingly, Schuller praises the book inside the cover, and Hywels highlights the book on his Willow Creek Internet website. Warren spent 12 weeks going door-to-door -door and surveying the needs of the people. Therefore, he offers what he calls a full menu of support groups for empty nesters, divorced couples, grief recovery, etc. In other words, whatever you want, that's what they give you, and not the truth. Okay? Man-centered um, philosophy, we kind of already dealt with this. Um, let's go to this next statement. This one here is the most revealing to me. This is very fascinating. He, here Mr. Warren is talking about the Reformation. And we've already discussed a little bit about it, how the Reformation came about because people wanted to follow the teachings of the Bible. And notice what he mentions about the Reformation. He said, the first Reformation was about belief. This one's going to be about behavior, said Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church in Southern California, author of The Purpose Driven Life. He said, the first one was about creeds. This one's going to be about our deeds. The first one divided the church. This time it will what? Unify the church. So in other words, the first Reformation, was that a good thing or a bad thing according to Mr. Warren? Was it a good thing? It was a bad thing. It divided the church. But this time it's going to unify the church. And it's not going to be about creeds. It's not going to be about the Bible. 
It's going to be about our deeds, doing nice things, raking people's um, yard and, and picking up their trash and things like that. that. That will be the way to unify people because the Bible's thrown away and we can just come together and love Jesus and, and, but not be based on the Bible, which is happening everywhere. Here's another statement. Today there really aren't that many fundamentalists left anymore. I don't know if you know that or not, but there are not... There is such a minority. There are not that many fundamentalists left in America, those who follow the Bible, um, which is true. There's not too many left. Here's another statement. He's talking, he was talking with T.D. Jakes here, another famous preacher, and he says, um, he's speaking to T.D. Jakes, and he says, one of the things television did is it allowed people to watch each other's services from a distance and go, that's okay. And you know, growing up as a Protestant boy, I knew nothing about Catholics, but I started watching the Catholic channel, and I said, well, I'm not as far apart from these guys as I thought I was, you know? And these are Protestant ministers saying this. You understand what I'm saying? This is not something that is good. Now, hold on to your hats. We're going to talk about Billy Graham. Now, I'm from North Carolina, and I'm, I'm very familiar with Billy Graham. In fact, he, he was born in the city I'm from, and, um, but it's fascinating that Mr. Graham has an, or he did, or he's getting old now, but he was very, very in much in league with the Pope. Now, it's fascinating. If you're a Protestant preacher, should you be in bed with the Pope as far as um, spiritually? No? Absolutely not. Let's read this statement. It says, um, following the New England crusade, thousands of those who came forward are now in the process of, of being integrated into the Catholic Church. Meetings have taken place between Graham and the Association and Catholic Clergy for the transfer of these people to the Roman Church. This is, was from Faith for the Family, November 1982. So as a Protestant evangelist, it would make sense to me that the people that you minister to would come into Protestant churches. Wouldn't that make sense? But here, they're going into the Catholic Church. It's very interesting. So, you know, I've always thought that if everybody in the world likes you, then perhaps you're not doing something right. Because Jesus... No one, not everyone liked Jesus, did they, when Jesus was on the earth? Not everyone liked what he said. So if someone likes, if everyone loves what you say, if, for example, let's say I preach a sermon one day and everyone comes to me after the sermon and say, oh, that was a great sermon. I love that message. Oh, beautiful. If everyone says that to me, guess what? I didn't really preach. Because if you really preach, you're going to make some people uncomfortable. Jesus, when he preached, he cut to the bone. So when people tell me it was a nice sermon, I don't really like that. I feel, oh, Lord, I let you down. I didn't really preach the truth because everyone likes it. You, always when you preach, you have people who do not like the truth. But Mr. Graham, everyone loves Mr. Graham. Of course, he's getting older. And notice what Richard Nixon said about him. He says, when you went into the ministry, politics lost one of its potentially greatest practitioners, speaking to Mr. Graham. And, of course, he was, spoke to thousands and millions of people and I believe he did a lot of good, He's leading people to Christ, but that's all, there was nothing more. It was just come to Jesus and then pretty much that's it. Here he was in the U.S. Capitol during the presentation of the Congressional Gold Medal to, to himself and his wife. And, you know, friends, this is a, the United States is a Protestant country. We should not put together church and state. And this is exactly what is portrayed there on the screen. In fact, notice the same statement here. On receiving an honorary doctorate from the Roman Catholic Belmont College, Billy Graham said, the gospel that founded this college is the same gospel which I preach today. Very interesting language. And um, he goes on by saying, the religious news uh, so services reported on January 13, 1981, Pope John Paul II was closeted for two hours with the Reverend Billy Graham, the world's best-known Protestant evangelist. So friends, is there anyone really protesting anymore? It doesn't seem like it. No one's protesting Everyone is holding hands with Rome. And actually, um, he says the Pope is almost an evangelist. So this is pretty fascinating stuff. Here he is with um, the late Pope. And here is Mr. Schuler and Billy Graham shaking hands together. And um, I won't say any more about that, but it's an interesting way they're shaking hands for those who like to know what I'm talking about. Here's another statement. It says, uh, Reagan was the first American president to appoint a full ambassador to the Vatican. This is um, Graham speaking. Before he made the appointment, he asked my view. I told him I thought it was probably a good thing in spite of a number of potential problems concerning the separation of church and state and wrote an extended a confidential letter outlining my reasons. Among the other things, I told him I did not think it necessarily violated the separation of church and state, for whatever reason, Mr. Reagan went ahead with the plan. 
Later, my letter was leaked to the press. It caused much consternation or some consternation among my Baptist friends. Well, I can imagine why. Because it was putting church and state together and it was actually bringing back uh, um, the Pope of Rome. And this is a very interesting book called Billy Graham and His Friends. If you doubt what I'm saying, this is a 700-page book with full documentation of many, many articles about Mr. Graham and his involvement with these other anti-Christian organizations that are very, very interesting. So if you want to get that book, you feel free to do it if you don't believe what I'm saying. So at this time, I'm going to talk a little about the charismatic movement. And um, the charismatic movement is a fascinating movement that's sweeping many denominations. The man on your left here um, is Rodney Howard Brown. He's, named, he's known as the Holy Ghost bartender. He makes people drunk, spiritually drunk, and they fall over and they laugh and all sorts of things. The other man is a German man by the name of Reinhard Bonke, and he, doesn't haul, he would never speak here. He speaks in canyons where he puts millions of people in the canyons and just curses the devil. He'll hold the Bible and say, I curse you, Satan. I curse you. I stomp on you. I trample upon you. And he just does that for like three hours at a time, and uh, that's pretty much his sermon. I don't really get much out of that. But anyway, he, that's what he does. And I'll show you some video here in a little bit of that. Here is, um, this is in uh, Time Magazine, Laughing for the Lord, People, Holy Laughter, the Toronto Blessing. You probably have heard of that before where people fall over and start shaking and so forth. You know, when I read my Bible carefully, the only time I find someone falling down and shaking is not when they're possessed by the Holy Spirit, but when they're possessed by another spirit, Right? And um, it's really sad what's happening. These are good people who want to go do what's right, but they've been led astray. Um, Unzipper heaven, Lord, ha, ha, ho, ho, he, he. Very interesting. And um, there's a thing called speaking in tongues, which I wish I had more time to, to um, elaborate on, but it's fascinating that um, you'll find these same manifestations in a lot of pagan religions. I had some video footage I was going to put in tonight, but I felt that it was a little too offensive. It might harm some of your finer sensibilities um, of people actually moving around on the floor who were into kundalini yoga, which is a specific type of yoga. And it was actually pretty, I didn't even want to show you what they were doing there, but they were on the floor moving around just like they do in many charismatic churches today. Same thing, it's just a different religion. So slain in the spirit is done in all these other religions, including Pentecostalism, uncontrollable laughter, it's every other religion and the Pentecostal movement, physical jerks takes place in all these religions, animal sounds, people barking. Um, I was in a church one time where people were actually barking and, and acting like roosters in the church. Can you imagine? Would God be uh, glorified by worship like that? And uh, it's amazing. Spontaneous movements, revival like meetings, speaking in tongues happens in every other um, religion, but in the Bible, it is qualified by Acts chapter 2. Now, if you read Acts chapter 2, you will find a very interesting circumstance where there was a lot of people gathered around on the day of Pentecost, 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 sorry, but they were not able to understand what he was saying, so God gave them the gift of tongues or languages so they could understand what he was preaching. Let's say, for example, I, my wife is from Japan. Let's say we go to Japan and do a series, and let's say I didn't have an opportunity to learn the language. God may deem fit to give me the gift of tongues. I could speak Japanese so people could understand, right? If, that, if God would deem to do that. That's the true biblical gift of tongues. It's not just to make a lot of noise and look crazy. It's to speak the gospel. Um, notice this statement um, from a New Age leader, Benjamin Cream. We have a whole lecture on the New Age movement, but we can't do it right now because we don't have time. But Benjamin Cream is a very prominent New Age leader, and he says the following. He says that the... He represents the New Age Christ who is to come, the one, not Jesus Christ, but the New Age Christ. He says, he was asked about the Toronto blessing, these people acting like dogs and cats and all sorts of animals and saying that it's the Holy Spirit. He said his response was that he thought the Toronto blessing was a good thing. It is, according to him, the method being used by his spiritual masters to soften up Christian fundamentalists to accept the New Age Christ when he appears. See, there's a coming Christ who's not Jesus Christ that people are going to worship. Now, the next few slides we're going to look at is another very prominent television evangelist. Um, many of you perhaps may have given money to his ministry in the past. Very famous. Um, I don't know if you know him up in Canada, but in the States he's very popular. Uh, his name is Kenneth Copeland. 
Now, Kenneth Copeland is also listed on many web pages as a 33rd degree Freemason. Now, I always say, if the shoe fits, what are you going to do with the shoe? You're going to wear the shoe. Let's see what he, if what he says corresponds with Masonic doctrine. Okay? Notice this. He said, when Jesus cried, it is finished, he was not speaking of the plan of redemption. There were still three days and nights to go through before he went to the throne. So he didn't believe that Christ accomplished redemption when he said it is finished. He, Jesus, is suffering all that there is to suffer. There is no suffering left apart from him. His emaciated, poured out little wormy spirit is down there in that thing called hell. And the devil thinks he's got him destroyed. That's not too nice to speak about Jesus, and nor is it biblical. Notice this one. This is from the force of love. Audio tape. There's that word again. You don't have a God in you. You are one. That's what he said in 1987. So you are God. Does that sound like Masonic doctrine to you? Sounds a bit like it to me. He goes on by saying, Now Peter said, By exceeding great and precious promises, you become partakers of the divine class. All right, are we gods? We are a class of gods. That's what he said on the PTL show way back in 1986. And this one is really astounding to me. Unbelievable stuff. He says, that Adam was God manifest in the flesh. God's reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. I mean a reproduction of himself in the Garden of Eden. He did, not, he did just that. He was not a little like God. He was not almost like God. He was not subordinate to God even. Adam is as much as like God as you could get, just the same as Jesus. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifested in the flesh. Is that biblical? No, it's not biblical. Okay. Here's another one. It says, The Spirit of God spoke to me and He said, Son, realize this. Now follow me in this thing and don't let your tradition or Bible perhaps trip you up. He said, Think this way. A twice-born man whipped Satan in his own domain. Okay, think about that for a moment. Was Jesus twice born? Did Jesus have to be born again? No, He did not. He didn't have to be born again. He was born uh, innocent in the beginning. He said, Think this way. A twice-born man whipped Satan in his own domain and I threw my Bible down like that. And I said, what? He said, a born-again man defeated Satan. The firstborn of many brethren defeated him. He said, you are the very image, the very copy of that one. And I said, goodness gracious, sakes alive. And I began to see what had gone on that thing in there. And I said, well, now you don't mean, you couldn't dare mean that I could have done the same thing. And he said, oh yeah. If you had the knowledge of the Word of God that he did, you could have done the same thing because you're a reborn man too. So basically, what is he saying there? That he could have died and he could have saved you. He could have done the same thing as Jesus. Okay. If you don't believe me, here's another statement. Um, in fact, this is from his own um, cassette here. And I don't know if you notice there on the front of that jacket some very interesting things laying on that table. Do you see what they are? A compass and a set square. Where have we seen that symbol before, like last night? This is a symbol of Freemasonry, the compass and the set square. Maybe it's just there for coincidence. I don't know, but... From what he's saying, it doesn't sound too coincidental to me. He says, and I say this with all respect so it don't upset you too bad, but when it, well, I'll say it anyway. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. Uh, believer's voice of victory, Kenneth Copeland. So he's saying that he is God. Here's another one, if you don't believe that one. God's on the outside looking in. He doesn't have any legal entry into the earth. The thing, that, that thing doesn't belong to him. You see how sassy the devil was in the presence of God in the book of Job when he said, where have you been? It wasn't any of God's business. He didn't even have to tell him where he, he, he was. He didn't even have to tell to answer him if he didn't want to. God didn't argue with him a bit. You see, this is the position that God's been in. Might say, well, if God's running things, he's doing a lousy job of it. He hadn't been running them except when, he, when he's just got, you know, a little bit of a chance. So these things are blasphemous statements. Very well-known Protestant preacher who claims to be protesting, but he says he's God, and he says that unbelievable stuff. This is uh, interesting, too. I, I wish I had a chance to do the New Age movement because we talk about um, the Mormon uh, faith, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the Jehovah's Witnesses, who were both founded by 33rd degree Freemasons. And I, I could show you that, prove that to you. And I, this is what Brigham Young said. He said, Adam is our father and our God. And what did Co Copeland say? Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifested in the flesh. So it's the same doctrine, the Freemasonry doctrine being preached. Okay, I'm going to show you a video now, short video of Mr. Copeland in action. And just to give you an idea, a little bit of a flavor of, uh, it's not a very long video, maybe 45 seconds, 
just to give you a little idea of the ministry of Mr. Copeland and see what biblical doctrines he's preaching, okay? Let's take a look at this video. Instead of that uh, Jim Bean or something, you know, I'm praying, God, hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, glory to God. Yeah, I get to do this for Jesus. <laughs> This is the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. Today, Gloria Copeland, my wife, will be concluding her series on the spirit of faith. Jesus' physical nature is the, he has the traits of his mother. <laughs> this is a beautiful church service held in Oklahoma. This poor girl is really terrified over there in the corner. So, did you hear a lot of biblical doctrine there? Not, not too, too much biblical doctrine. I don't know if you noticed his hand. His hand was put up in an interesting way. And that is a symbol of Lucifer, actually. And he does that quite a lot, Mr. Uh, Copeland. Um, this is um, the Rima Institute. This is Kenneth Hagen, the man that you saw just a minute ago, blessing people, uh, supposedly. Um, that's uh, he and his lovely wife um, at the Rima Bible Institute. And another man is very prominent in the world today is a man by the name of Benny Hinn. Maybe you've seen him on television. And Benny Hinn says something very fascinating. He says, don't tell me you have Jesus. You are everything he was and everything he is and every, everything he shall be. Don't say I have. Say I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. Does that sound familiar, what we looked at so far? It's the same doctrine, it's just a different need. He's meeting the needs of being, for people being healed. But this is a very prominent site, um, not very prominent, but very interesting site, mentioning the religious leaders who are high 33rd degree Freemasons. You see very interesting names there. Uh, Billy Graham, Norman Vincent Peale, Robert Schuller, Oral Roberts, Jesse Jackson, Mormon leaders, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, and the founders of Jehovah's Witness Church as well. And um, again, like I said, these are just statements. You can research it out yourself. And the statements are very, very interesting. Here are some other very prominent leaders of the world today, very prominent politicians. All of them there you see listed. Um, Tony Blair is listed as a 33rd degree Freemason, as well as the late Yasser Arafat, Ronald Reagan, Gorbachev. Many, many famous people, even Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt were listed as very high Freemason. Um, also, uh, Kissinger, list, well, not a 33rd degree, but a, a, a Freemason of some sort. Walt Disney was listed as a 33rd degree Freemason, and that's very obvious if you watch any of the movies. They're very full of the occult. And um, it's really sad because children are being indoctrinated by these occult cartoons. And I was one of them, too, when I was young. I used to watch it, too. Interesting down here, um, Billy Graham is listed there, um, as we've seen. Very interesting. And John Glenn, Buzz Aldrin, very interesting that in, the, in NASA you'll find many either very high Mormons or very high Freemasons. Very interesting. I don't, I'm, not a, I'm not sure what they're doing up there, but maybe it's not so good after all. Um, just a couple others there you can, you're probably familiar with. Um, who else? Prince Philip, 33rd degree Freemason, Rockefeller, so forth. So these are pretty important people. So as we bring this thing to a close tonight, just a few more um, statements to look at, but according to the papacy itself, as we've looked at so far, we've looked at that Freemasonry was a, a creation of the Jesuit order and that they actually wanted to bring Protestants back to the mother church. Does it look like that could be a possibility tonight? Absolutely. Let's look at this statement um, from the Pope himself way back, the late Pope. As reported in an Associated Press with the Dalai Lama sitting by his right side in October 1999 in Rome, the Pope presided at a special council at some 2,000 religious leaders of various faith, sects, and cults. This is what went on, and he said something very fascinating. He said, the, the pontiff told the assembled Buddhist monks, Zoroastrian priests, Catholic cardinals, Hindu gurus, American Indian shaman, Jewish rabbis, and ecumenical clergy that all must join in condemning the Islamic fundamentalists, is that what it says? What does it say? The Christian fundamentalists who abuse speech and whose effort at converting others incite hatred and violence. So we should condemn those who preach the Bible. That's the message. 
And this next statement is even more, more open. He says, um, religious fundamentalists who refuse to go along with the global ecumenical mo movement are to be, what's that next word? Silenced. They must be denounced as dangerous extremists full of hate. Have you ever heard of the hate crime bills that are being passed? Friends, the reason these bills are going to be passed is it's going to be illegal very soon to tell what the truth is. It's very hard for me even today to tell you the truth. Much opposition. But I praise God because His Word and the prophecies have to be shown they're happening right now. Notice this next statement. Who is the only hindrance to this plan? Notice this statement. The Catholic Church changed the observance of the Sabbath to Sunday by right of the divine infallible authority given her by her founder, Jesus Christ. The Protestant claiming the Bible to, have, to be the only guide of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, the Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. This was in 1942. So according to the papacy, the only problem child left in the world today is this group here, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay? And we'll look a little bit more into that in the future. Are these disturbing truths we looked at tonight a fulfillment of prophecy? Let's take a look at what Revelation tells us. Revelation 18, verses 1 to 4. The Bible says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Verse 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the what? Habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. You see, friends, what I'm telling you tonight isn't just something wild and crazy. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. The Bible said in the last days that Babylon would be filled with the habitation of devils and have every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And remember what we looked at? Um, I, we spoke um, about health the other night, and we discussed that um, later on, actually last night in the question and answer period about certain birds being clean and unclean. A dove is characterized as the Holy Spirit and that dove, a dove is a clean bird, right? So here we have an unclean bird which denotes an unclean spirit that is invading um, Babylon, the, the fallen churches that aren't following what the Bible says. Verse 3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the, what's that next word? Kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth, which we don't have time to talk about, unfortunately, are wax rich through the abundance of delicacies. And what's God's response? What does God want us to do as Christians? Verse 4, And I heard another voice from he heaven saying, Come out of her, who? My people. You see, friends, God has an extremely difficult dilemma. God has good people in all these organizations that are following after the beast. And He wants to call those people out of that system. He wants to call people out of that system into a system that follows what the Bible says. And God tells us these disturbing things in order for us to wake up and see just where we're living in time and to come out of these systems, these false systems of worship. And He goes on by saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Friends, tonight this message is a salvation message in the last days. Because if we are a part of a system that does these types of things, we will be partakers of her sins, share in her sins and in her plagues. And I don't want to do that. I want to be on Jesus' side 100%. So we're close tonight with a, one last question. What will be the ultimate result of the ecumenical movement? And for this, I would like you to turn in your own Bibles and take a look with me in Isaiah 24, verses 19 through 22. We'll look at this, and then we have one more uh, verse to look at, one more passage. Isaiah, you'll find it in the Old Testament. Isaiah 24, verses 19 to 22. Notice with me what God says in His Word. In verse 19, it says, The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean, dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. This is after the second coming. Verse 20, it says, The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish the hosts of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. And notice verse 22, And they shall be, what's the next two words? Gathered together. So they will be gathered together. The ecumenical movement, the ultimate result is they're going to be gathered together. 
but it'll be after Jesus comes and as the Lord will destroy the wickedness of the earth. And it goes on by saying, As prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. So friends, that's the ultimate result of the ecumenical movement. It's going to be destroyed. God's going to destroy it. He's going to put an end to it. And remember the, fi- remember the whole premise of the ecumenical movement from last night? I don't know if you can remember it, but it was to, to acknowledge the supreme spiritual authority of the Bishop of Rome. Remember that? So that has to fall. Now, 1 Thessalonians tells us, before we do that, I'll ask this question, what will be the ultimate result of those who have true unity by keeping the commandments of God and having the faith of Jesus? I forgot I had another verse here. Excuse me, I have to get my Bible again. And that's found in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. What is the ultimate result of those people who stand on the Bible and the commandments of God? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16 and 17. There it is. I knew it was in my Bible. There it is. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Notice with me what the Bible says. It says, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. What's that next word? Together with them in the, air, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Friends, if we stand on God's Word and God's words alone, we will go up together to meet Jesus in peace. And friends, that's what I want more than anything else. I tell you these things as a brother in Christ who wants to warn you because things are happening at a breakneck speed and we're not even aware how everyone's going back to mother, the mother church. So our only safety, friends, is we follow this book. If we follow what God says, we can never go wrong. And as we make Jesus our friend and study his word, we have nothing to be afraid of whatsoever. Thank you.